Log Talk Radio. Mitchamo Apura Kanu, Apura Kaitlu, the Neye Kokoba, the Medinde Ojirapo, Kwesi Ran and Pata Akan. Akamumai and Maruka, the Tipi Mu Ojirapo. I mean, greetings to all Apura Kani, Apura Kaitni people, many African black people today. is Kokobo Day. My name is Ojirapo. Kwesi Radnehem Bata Akan, or Birapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Yet I say we thank you for tuning in to this special broadcast. Um, we're just pulling up the chat room right now. We're opening up the chat room, and Blog Talk is taking a minute to open up. Um, if you are have a question or a comment on the phone line, just hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised and we can connect with you. If you are um, going to log into the chat room, if you want to have a question or a comment in the chat room, you must log in as a user in the chat room in order to interact in the chat room. And if you don't have um, a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk. So as we're rebooting this uh, chat room right quick, looks like it's taking a minute to come up. We might have to boot it one more time. All right, now it looks like it's about to come in. We're going to place some links in the chat room. Right now, it's pulling back up right now. All right, we're going to place some links in the chat room regarding the information that we will be dealing with tonight. Um, we have, a, of course, a couple of announcements. Uh, we had uh, the sister Ma'at in Ma'al Keru on last night on Egua Marketplace, and she is her business or, or the institution that she founded, the Heb Ma'al Ka, which is the Soul Psychic Fair. Um, that is the Okom Economic Development Business of the Week, and therefore, um, check out the Okom Economic Development page on our website, and you'll see the link to that. Of course, the Soul Psychic Fair, the Heb Ma'al Ka, is actually coming up this weekend, this Nimenada, this Saturday on um, July 25th. It's from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. in Durham, North Carolina, so you will see all of the information um, on her link. We'll put the link in the chat room once the uh, chat room comes up, and it's still taking a minute to load up. So give us just a second as we're pulling this up. And it looks like some, now it's, it's starting to come up now. Um, and again, for the individuals who are just getting onto the phone line, if you have a question or a comment, uh, just hit the number one on the phone line so we can see that your hand is raised. Um, and again, if you're, the chat room is starting to pull up now. It's taking a minute to, to come on. And it's still logging in. So. Looks like it's just slow, but okay. Let's see if we might have to, we're gonna have to re- reboot that one more time because it showed up as an error, and it was a little slow last night. So they maybe law talk could be having some issues um, with the chat room that happens every now and then. Try to pull that up one more time. Um, but once it is up, again, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk. We're going to put the link to the Home Economic Development Model page so you can see the list of businesses there. Uh, it's on the website. Okay, and it's pulled up now. And we'll put that link in the chat room right now. You, and if you're not in the chat room, OG.co.com is our website, O-D-W-I. R A F is in free O dot com O D W I R A F is in free O dot com and the page itself is the Okom page on our website O K O M and when you go to that page you will see um hold on one second okay when you go to that page you will see the list of businesses organizations, and institutions, um, and you'll see that the uh, Soul Psychic Fair Heaven All Call is the most recent one we posted on that page. And, of course, we will be um, 
in North Carolina this Saturday, this Mimenida, July 25th, at the Soul Psychic Fair, doing a presentation on our publication, Who Do People, Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, in North America, Akan, custodians of Hoodoo from ancient Ndunu land, Kanit, Nubia. So we're going to be doing a presentation on that. Um, we're one of the presenters at the event. So we're going to put a couple of links in the chat room right now for the information that we will be going over. So we're putting a link to the Coco Ball piece. Um, we're also going to put a link to our publications page on the website, the Unhoma page. We have 16 books um, all together. One of them is the Coco Ball publication, which we will be dealing with tonight. For the 16 books, all of the ebook versions of our publication are free downloads from our website, from the Unhoma page on our website. We also have the soft cover version of our publication. And those we do sell, um, they range between $8 and $11. If you order um, 10 books or more, like the 10 book set for 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 book set, um, it's automatically 30% off. So you'll see that on the Unhoma page on the link. And hold on one second, let me make sure. Okay, so we're going to put that link in the chat room right now. If you're on the phone line, the the link is the Unhoma link, the publication page link on the website, N-H-O-M-A, the Unhoma link on the website, and so that's what we're doing with. Okay, and we're going to put a direct link to the book that we're dealing with. So you, when you go to the Unhoma page, you'll get that. You'll see all of the 16 books. Um, one of them is Call Call Ball, and we're going to put that direct link as well directly to the ebook version of that book in the uh, chat room as well. And the Call Call Ball book is K-O-K-O-B-O. -O -O. All right. So for the individuals who are new to the broadcast, we have, typically we have three broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan to Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion on Joda on Monday night. Then we also have, we deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion on Monday nights, dealing with cosmology and culture and philosophy, clarifying um, points of cosmology and culture and philosophy, the nature of the Supreme Being, the Great Mother and Great Father, Inyamewa and Inyame, the nature of the Abosom, the forces in nature, the nature of the Nananum Nsamapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors and their relationship to us and how we harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order through the agency of the Abosom and Insulam for the deity, the ancestral spirits, and so forth. So we deal with that and clarify misinformation that's being propagated in the Western Hemisphere as well as um, on the continent by those who have been infected by Christianity and Islam and Judaism and, and Hinduism and Buddhism and white culture in general. So that's what we deal with on Akanto Nanasom when we show the direct connection from our ancient Akan ancestral religion from ancient Akana, Nubia, to West Afuraka, Afuraka, the ancient empire of Ghana, and then later the Akana or Akan civilization in the forest belt and into the Western Hemisphere, those of us who were drawn from those regions during the Musu Oketsie, the great perversity, the enslavement era, into North Central South America, the Caribbean and Europe. We continue to practice our Akan ancestral religion in these areas, manifest in various forms, for example, Kudu in North America, Obia in Jamaica, Winti in Suriname, and so forth, South America. We continue to practice our Akan ancestral religion. So we deal with uh, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion from that perspective on Joda Monday night. On Benada or Abenada Tuesday night, we have Ojida, which means purification. And we're talking about the purification of culture, purification of understanding, dealing with Afurakani, Afurakani, and such religion in general, how it impacts every aspect of our lives, dealing with culture, nation building, and so forth. So we always talk about how Ojida, or purification, operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes Afurakani, Afurakani, and such religion. 
and ancestral religion in essence is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. So that means through ritual we incorporate those same objects, deeds, and entities we need to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we restore balance to our lives by rejecting those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to hate, to reject, to repel, in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and realign ourselves with order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, those are the expansive the contractive poles of ancestral religion. Afurakani, Afurai Kaitni, ancestral religion or African ancestral religion, no matter what form or expression it takes, wherever we find ourselves in the world, fundamentally, it's the same process. We align with the Supreme Being and the order of the Supreme Being, the order of creation through the agency of the deities and ancestors, ancestors and ancestors the forces in nature, the embodiments of divine order, and our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who give us the guidance on how to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order based on our ancestral makeup, based on our ancestral plan, creation, and so forth. So we deal with that. We go over texts from ancient Kemet and clarify concepts as well as ritual practices and motifs and um, oral traditions and so forth from our expression of ancestral religion all over the continent. So that's what we deal with on Benada or Abenada Tuesday night. On Awukuda or Akwada Wednesday night, we have Egwa Marketplace Day. We have individuals come on to talk about their businesses, organizations, institutions, how they are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, um, and how their ancestral religious values inform their service to the community. So we've had a number of individuals come on, and when you look at our website and look at, look at the links, you see the links to their various uh, businesses, organizations, and institutions. In addition to that, you'll also see the link to the broadcast interviews that they did with us on the Egua Marketplace show. We've also published the Okom Economic Development Model. It's an economic development model rooted in Afurakani, Afurakaitni, and ancestral religious values. When we align ourselves spiritually with who we are, then we can move forward interdependently and support one another in a natural, harmonious fashion. And then we utilize a strategy and we publish this model. The strategy born of that model is to starve the beast and feed the pride. And that simply means we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have wasted potentially with white businesses and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We take those funds away from those white businesses, do not spend with them, and reallocate those funds to the Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution of the week. We are targeting one Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks for capital infusion, optimal capital infusion. We have, this is week number 20. So over the past five months, we've, as a community, have supported a business per week over the past five months. Um, the reason that we're doing that, of course, is because we want optimal capital infusion. So if you, when you starve the beast and feed the pride, making an assessment, for example, instead of spending $10 at Walmart over the course of a week or $10 at McDonald's over the course of a week, you make a decision and you decide to starve that white beast and feed the pride. You take that $10 that you would have handed to the white narrow screen, starve the beast, and feed the pride, directed to the business organization or institution of the week. Whether you make a donation or you purchase their products at such their services and so forth, the decision is you're either going to give those funds to our enemies to continue to finance our own oppression and employ them and enrich them, or you're going to direct that money to the organization, institution, or business of the week. Of course, if a 1,000 of our people did that, then that's a $10,000 infusion of capital to the business, organization, or institution of the week. Such an infusion of capital to a black business or organization or institution will allow them to expand their services to our community to serve us at a greater capacity, hire people within our community so that they can serve us at a greater capacity, 
and take care of their families at the same time. It's a win-win situation. If we do not do that by default, we are leaving that $10,000 in the hands of our absolute enemies, the white and narrow spring, and we're enriching them, enriching their families, giving them money for no reason while we're reaching in our pockets to give thousands of dollars and actually billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to our absolute enemies while our people are struggling, unemployed, underemployed, and so forth. We have absolutely no business and no reason to continue to enrich our enemies when we can simply starve the beast and feed the product. So this is what we're dealing with. Um, of course, this is week number 20. Once again, the business of the week is the Soul Psychic Fair founded by Ma'at M. Ma'at Keru. And the sister was on our show last night, so you can actually listen to that broadcast archive from last night. She talked about her journey in ancestral culture and religion and so forth, um, how she came to found the Head Ma'at Ka, that is the name made to connect, Hair meaning festival, Ma'at meaning to see, or seer, and Ka meaning the soul. So it is the festival of the seers of the soul. So they have a number of different individuals doing divination, all kinds of reading. Communicating with the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, your ancestors and ancestors to communicate those messages to you so you can go to the different uh, readers and so forth and get divination from them. There are also people selling um, their books as well as um, healing um, implements as well as shea butter and stones and whatever we need as a people. They have those different um, kinds of vendors. And then there are a few presenters that will be presenting on Saturday. And of course, for example, one of the presenters is Rakit Kajara Nia Het, the founder of Ra Seki Kometic Reiki. We've had her on the show. She will be one of the presenters. She's also an authoress, publishing Ra Seki Volume 1, Ra Seki Volume 2, and so forth, and a number of different books. Um, so there are a number of presenters, and of course, we will be presenting as well. So you can get all that information on the page. So what we wanted to do tonight Special broadcast, we typically do not broadcast on Yauda on Thursday, but we wanted to announce our initiative. And the initiative is Koko Ba. That initiative, Koko Ba, is also the name of our one of our books, one of our 16 books. And that book is called Koko Ba. The term Koko Ba in the Akan tradition means warning. And the book is a collection of four different publications, four different articles that we've published, and we put them all together in one publication dealing with the reality that dissexuality, homosexuality was never accepted in ancient Kemet, but also specifically and foundationally dealing with the reality of the divine prohibition against dissexuality, homosexuality. So, of course, the White Narrow Spring have been trying to put forth the false notion that in ancient Kemet there was dissexuality, homosexuality, and so forth. Of course, they are always attempting to force their perverse nature into our culture to turn our people away from that because they do not want us to embrace our ancestral religion, our ancestral culture. Because when we embrace that, that simply means that we are embracing divine order because our culture is the acceptance of order and the rejection of this order. That is what our culture is as Apurakani, Apurakani people, African people. Of course, we have our book, Apuraka, Apuraka, the origin of the term Africa, which we have published and proven in that publication that the term Africa comes from Apuraka, Apuraka, the land, Ka, Kaya, of Afura, Afura, the creator and the creator. So they do not want us to realign with our own culture and our own ancestral religion. Because when we align with our own culture, meaning our way of life and our own ancestral religion, that means we are realigning with divine order. Because our culture is the divine acceptance of order and divine rejection of this order. That is our cultural way of life is. So when we accept order, we also reject this order and its prevailing. That means we reject or hate, repel the whites and their offspring, their culture, their pseudo religion. And when we reject them, exercise divine hate against them, then we understand what's going on. When we realign ourselves with order, we begin to engage the Amain Sesu, a nation-building process, and we defend 
the nation that we established by destroying our enemies because they will always seek to destroy what we build. The whites and their offspring have sought to control the minds of our people for thousands of years, and it's only been over the past 100 plus years through the introduction intensely of the false religions of Christianity and Islam and so forth that some of our people have been falling for that nonsense after the advent of enslavement and so forth. They've been pushing these fake religions for hundreds of years, but they hadn't caught on until really recently, over the past 100 plus years, between the past 100 and 200 years, that's when they really began to catch on after the advent of enslavement and so forth, the various wars that took place. So the whites and their offspring understand that once we embrace our culture, we will reject them, reject their fake culture, fake religion, fake gods, and so forth, and return to ourselves. That also means anything that they have introduced. They have been promoting dissexuality, homosexuality heavily for thousands of years, and of course they've ramped that up in this country and wherever they are in the world over the past year increasingly. And of course the um, legalization of the perversity of pseudo marriage between people of the same sex. That is the perverse nature of the whites and their offspring that has nothing to do with our people. They've always put forth this false notion that dissexuality, homosexuality is natural and, you know, people are born with that. Of course, that is absolutely false. We utilize the term dissexuality because dis means not. The two men or two women cannot engage in sexuality. What they're engaged in something is something that is not sexuality. It doesn't rise to that definition. So we more properly use the term dissexuality because when you have disorder, for example, order is not present. When you have dissexuality, sexuality is not present. So this is why we utilize that terminology. When you look at the publication that we put forward, not only does it prove in these various texts that the white and offspring pulled out from ancient Kemet, trying to say it has something to do with the sexuality. We prove that it does not. We translate these texts properly to prove that conclusively, but it also goes further to demonstrate, just on a spiritual fundamental level, not only do the text bear this out, the specific text that we address, but in general, this sexuality is out of harmony with divine order. But when you look at the book, it also addresses what's going on right now. The different articles in the book, and when you go through the book and we put the link in the chat room, you'll find the four different articles. The first one is the divine prohibition against dissexuality, homosexuality, and ancient commands. And that's dealing with a specific passage in the Runu Per Imheru, the so-called Book of the Dead, proving conclusively that there's a divine prohibition against dissexuality. The second article in this book is showing that the twin Ni'ank, Kunwimu, and Kunwimu Hetep, these were identical twins. The whites and their offspring attempted to say that these, this was the first bisexual or homosexual couple in history. In reality, they are identical twins. And then we show that information in detail and the cosmology that undergirds their connection. The next uh, text in the book, Set and Anat, the dating of the contending of Teru and Set. We show in that particular text that, of course, this sexuality was not being promoted in that text, and also showing the um, ramifications of when the foreigners entered Northern Kemet and took over a portion of Northern Kemet for a while, and certain texts began to become corrupt. And we prove within the text the foreign influence because of the introduction in the text of foreign goddesses into the cosmology of ancient Kemet as they're going through the text. So that puts a date stamp on the text. When the foreigners show up, the foreign goddesses show up in the text, and also this perverse um, pseudo this sexual episode, which actually, even in the corrupted version of the text, is still not an actual this sexual episode, but the whites and offspring would like to promote it as that. And then we also show a, a, another text dealing with uh, Baal and Anat, showing that being the original text from which this one was corrupted. So we're going to detail about that, but it also has ramifications for what's going on today. And then we have the instructions of Pata Hatef. There's a specific instruction of Pata Hatef. The Western offspring would like to say that it has to do with 
um, having sex with an effeminate male, talking about a dissexual homosexual relationship. In reality, when you actually translate the actual text, it's a um, prepubescent sexual taboo. It's talking about the, the father is directing the young man about the taboo against engaging in sexual intercourse with someone who is prepubescent. For example, someone is 16 years old, for example, in a traditional culture, a young man, and he goes through his rites of passage um, training, manhood training, and so forth. And once those ceremonies are done, he's considered a young man. And he has the right to marry. Now, there may be a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old girl, and she has not gone through her rites of passage yet. But then there's another 16-year-old girl who has already um, experienced the onset of minar, the menstrual cycle beginning, and when you go into rural areas and the onset of minar is at a later age. When you get more towards urbanized areas where if food is more processed and so forth, the younger and younger the onset of minar begins. So you have girls 10, 11, 12, and so forth, the period begins, the cycle begins, the menstrual cycle begins. But then in rural, rural areas, you have them 14, 15, 16, sometimes even as late as 17 when the period began. So you can have a young woman who's 16 as well, has not had her first cycle yet, so she has not yet begun her womanhood training, yet she looks like the other 16-year-old girl who has already had her cycle and has gone through her womanhood training, and now she's a young woman and she's ready to marry as a 16-year-old uh, 16-year-old male. But he may see the other one who has not gone through that yet, that woman is still, she's not a woman yet because she hasn't had her cycle. Maybe she's going to have it in two or three weeks, and she's going to go through womanhood training then. But she hasn't had it yet, although she looks like the other 16-year-old, she is still considered pre-pubescent. So therefore, there's a taboo about trying to engage in intercourse with a young woman who is not yet a woman. So this is what that text is talking about. So we properly translate that. So not only do we prove in those publications all contained in this one book that this sexuality, homosexuality never existed in ancient Kemet and was not accepted and there's a spiritual cosmological foundation for the repudiation of this sexuality, but it also speaks to what's going on today, the prepubescent sexual taboo. Of course, there's some perverted male trying to molest children, but then some perverted males trying to pretend like, well, if, you know, as long as they have reached that age where the girls are starting to menstruate and so forth, they're trying to force themselves on those young women and coerce those young women into sexual activity. And then you have those males influencing younger males who are teenagers and so forth, and they're like, hey, as long as they're ready to have sex, we, we can do that. And that leads, of course, to teenage pregnancy and everything else. But when we have a cultural foundation for a taboo, a spiritual taboo, a spiritual restriction, and all the ramifications connected with that, physical and spiritual, that are negative if you engage in that process, we begin to restore culture, restore morality to our people. So it speaks directly to what's going on today. With the set and I'm not the corrupted version of that text that the White and Spring put forward, and they talk about uh, set trying to sodomize Heru, which actually did not happen in the text. But they even put, they still put it forward in a false rendering. Even within that false rendering, that whole notion of Set trying to attack Heru, even though it's a false rendering, is still Set, who is the uncle trying to sodomize the child. And of course, that happens in our community. How do we end that? How do we eradicate that? What do we do with the individual? Of course, those individuals deserve to be killed. Child molesters deserve to be kill. They don't deserve therapy. They deserve death. And that's always been our practice. But then you also have offset responding to Heru, even though the text is uh, mistranslated and we do the proper translation to talk about what actually takes place. But even in the corrupted translation, they still have the piece where offset kills Heru and the healing process, the cleansing process. So if somebody has gone through this child molestation piece, there's wisdom within that text of the cleansing process, the realignment process to overcome that. 
and then we, of course, we also have in, in the first portion of the text the divine prohibition itself. So before we get into that particular, we're going to get into some of that text, but the key here is when we published this text, not only did we prove foundationally that this is not part of our culture, it has not been part of our culture for thousands of years and it never will be because it is against divine order. And our culture is the expression of order and the impression of order. So anything outside of divine order is not part of our culture. So we, we prove that conclusively. The next piece, however, is we want to not only have the book as something informational, but it's actually an application. It can be applied to every aspect of the lives of individuals who have gone through these various negative experiences. And when you go to our Coco Ball page, we explain that. And we're going to put the, the link is in the chat room. We'll put that link right back up. Now, we did a broadcast called Coco Ball Eradicating Dissexuality and Homosexuality Through Ancestral Religion. We, of course, reference our publication, but we're showing here in the broadcast. And you can download that broadcast um, from our YouTube page as well as the Blog Talk Radio page. The practice of Akurakani, Akuraikaidi, ancestral religion, we have the capacity to overcome all obstacles placed before us. We show that through overcoming alcohol and drug addiction and so forth. We can also use, utilize our ancestral religious practices to overcome the negative effects of domestic abuse, the negative effects of intergenerational trauma, transcarnational trauma, and of course, inclusive of that is overcoming the negative effects and the negative spiritual entity that it negatively influenced people dealing with child molestation, rape, and so forth, leading individuals to dissexuality, homosexual um, behavior. 95 plus percent of our people who are engaged in these perverse behaviors are engaged in such behaviors as a result of that kind of trauma. Child molestation, rape, torture, sometimes, you know, as children, sometimes as adults. Child molestation, rape, torture, all kinds of trauma that leads people to be disoriented spiritually. And once they're disoriented spiritually, then they become open. Then they become receptive to influences from other individuals, physical and non-physical. Very similar to when you have a, a wound, a cut. If your arm is cut and you're bleeding and so forth, you put an antiseptic there, often will cover the wound so further infection will not take place. But if you just leave it open, then you set yourself up for further infection. And if you are around areas or individuals where that kind of infection can take place, then you will further infect the wound and it will cause even greater problems because you have because you're open, the wound is open, you're more receptive to further infection. In the same fashion, when someone is wounded, attacked, raped, tortured, molested, assaulted with regard to trauma and so forth, then there's a wound, there's an opening a weakness within the spirit. And if it is not covered up, if it's not closed up, and not covered up in the sense of covering, but closed up and healed, if, you, if the wound is left open, then that person is susceptible to influences from individuals, physical and non-physical. In this culture, someone is molested and they suffer from some spiritual discordance, spiritual disalignment, Typically, normally, in our own ancestral culture, no matter what kind of spiritual alignment, disalignment takes place, we engage in ritual practice to realign the individual. In this culture, it's no different than placing antiseptic in the wound, cleaning the wound, and covering the wound to allow it to heal. And then the body heals itself and develops a scab and so forth. And that scab covers up the wound, creates a natural band-aid to send off further infection while it's healing under the scab. And by the time the scab falls off, the wound is fully healed, no more infection. In this culture, when someone is wounded in that uh, situation, trauma and so forth, then the culture begins to feed them and influence them. When they're spiritually disaligned and having perverse thoughts and so forth, the white and narrow screen teach you, well, those thoughts are natural because that's who you really are. In fact, that's who you are when you were born, and you need to go with that. In fact, if you go against that and if you feel negative tension and a dilemma with regard to 
how you're feeling and these kind of negative thoughts and so forth, these perverse, this sexual thoughts and so forth, because you're replaying what actually happened to you and you're having negative experiences. They will tell you the reason that those experiences feel negative is because you're resisting them and you really need to accept them and accept the fact that that's who you really are. And they constantly attempt to influence through schools, through media, through music, through movies, through news organizations on every level, through pseudo-religious institutions, whether it's pseudo-New Age spirituality, pseudo-humanities and so forth, pseudo-psychology, as well as certain kinds of churches and other pseudo-religious organizations, constantly impacting the individual to lure them into the false belief that we should be embracing this sexual perverse uh, suggestion and influence. And the person begins to believe, well, maybe there's something wrong with me because I'm resistant. And then once they engage the practice and go ahead and engage the practice, then they feel like they're damaged goods at that point and they must be a dissexual. And they're tormented mentally and spiritually for the rest of their lives as long as they're engaged in that not. That's on the physical side. On the spiritual side, those discarnate, perverse uh, relatives and non-relatives. They were just as perverse when they were alive. They're just as perverse when they make their transition. If there was a child molester when they were alive, a rapist when they were alive, when they make their transition, they are filthy, perverse, discordant spirit hanging around, hovering, or hovering around those who have a weakened spiritual immunity. The spiritual immunity has been compromised. So instead of repelling such negative spirits and negative thoughts, they're open to them. And then the person has these thoughts or draws or magnetism towards someone of the same sex and a repulsion for somebody of the opposite sex. They're not having that repulsion because it's part of who they are. That discarnate spirit is pushing them towards them and whispering in their ear, trying to influence them towards the person of the same sex and creating a negative energy and a repulsion for someone of the opposite sex. They assume, the individual assumes it's just them, and that's how they're feeling. So if they're just feeling this, then if they deny it, then they're denying themselves. And this culture outwardly would say, well, you're denying yourself. But in reality, there's a pervert. It's no different than the pervert if he was alive, if he was standing in front of the person saying, hey, stop looking at somebody of the opposite sex. And he grabbed him and pushed him in front of the person of the same sex. And if they tried to walk away, he pushed them in front of the person of the same sex again. And if they saw somebody of the opposite sex and started walking towards them, he would snatch them away and make them suffer some physical pain. Well, if that was happening, they would know what's happening because the person is doing it right in front of them, and they would fight the person. But if that person is a deceased spirit and generating negative energy and discordance and nausea and everything else and repulsion, magnetism being repelled away from somebody every time they think about the opposite sex or move towards the opposite sex, that spirit is doing the same thing in the spirit realm and pushing them away but then pushing them towards somebody of the same sex. So all the person knows is that they have these feelings. And they'll say, well, ever since I was a child, I was feeling this. Or for those who were tortured and raped and molested and so forth, ever since that took place, they've been feeling this because now they, once that happened, they were open to such perverse spirits. They used to repel easily. But now that that happened to them, now they're open to such spirits. And now those spirits begin to influence them. And they, they say, well, ever since that happened to me, now I've been feeling this way. And the therapist, the so-called psychologist, the pseudo-spiritualist will tell them, well, maybe deep down inside you're just really embarrassed because, not because of the rape or the molestation, but deep down inside you were really that way all along, ever since you were a child. And will convince them in that direction to the point that they will actually engage in some of this sexual act physically. And then once that happens, they're like, now it's over, I'm really a homo, and it's over, I can't do anything else but embrace this reality which is nonsense. So we went into detail about that, showing these different dynamics. But we also, through ancestral religion, aligning with your kra, your kra, your soul, your divine consciousness, and aligning with your nananum insamampo, your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of your direct blood circle, your people. They will snatch those desires up out of you and help you to repel them because they were never part of you anyway. They were superimposed upon you. So through the practice of ancestral religion, that is overcome instantly. Of course, anybody can become physically celibate overnight, instantly, in one second. You can just stop and decide, I'm being celibate right now. 
The only thing left is those so-called desires. But those so-called desires are super imposition coming from physically the whites and their offspring and their perverse culture, as well as spiritually these this kind of perverse spirits who are hanging around. And when you repel them, those desires are gone. So you're not, there's no such thing as, well, I'm going to struggle with this, with this for the rest of my life. That's nonsense. The whites and their offspring don't want our people to understand that. So we put that information out. And we did that broadcast to prove that. And once we put that broadcast out, then people began to download that information and realize, and of course, some individuals began to move in that process, first, physically becoming celibate, secondly, dealing with their unsamanfo to repel that perversity. And they, quote, unquote, cured themselves because they were never really the sexual in the first place. And of course, you have a very small percentage, less than 5% of our people who are criminals, the same kind of people who would murder somebody, the same kind of people who would torture and rape somebody, they're cultural criminals, and they engage in this sexuality because they're perverse. They, they become just like the whites and offspring, have repelled their own crop, and they promote this sexuality. They promote homosexuality. These are enemies of our people. We don't seek to ally with them. We don't seek to c connect with them. They're no different than the KKK. They are absolute enemies of our people. They are the perverse, the rich. They're no different than criminals, rapists, murderers, and so forth. They promote that foolishness. They are our enemies and deserve everything that our enemies get. But the vast majority of our people involved in that nonsense, that perversity, that bisexual perversity, came into it because of perversity. And through ancestral religion, we can overcome that as well, well as any other obstacle as well, whether it's alcohol, drug addiction, and so forth. But we put that information out. But now we want to move forward on a higher level with that information and it becomes a movement to eradicate this sexuality, eradicate homosexuality from the Afurakani, Afurakani community. That's why the offering is no, 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 you can't do that. They're going to tell you you can't do something. They're going to tell you no. We're going to make you people bisexual and you can't do anything about it. That's what they're trying to teach you. But we can eradicate this sexuality, homosexuality from the Afurakani, Afurakani community just like we can eradicate any other ill from the community. And we have that power within ancestral religion, and it has been proved. And this changes the game, because the whites and our spring never wanted us to get back to this reality. They never wanted us to reconnect with divine order, because when you are realigned with divine order, you repel and destroy, stamp out disorder in all of its manifestations and its purveyor. So we move this cocoa ball teaching from, you know, doing the broadcast and publishing the book to a movement to get this information out to as many people, many of our people as possible. So this is why we were prompted by the Nanano Nsumapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors and the Abothon, to establish, just yesterday, establish a cocoa ball eradicating this sexuality, homosexuality through ancestral religion page. We established that page on Facebook. We have a link on our regular website, of course. And we posted, of course, the information. We post the information of the book. Of course, the ebook version of our book is a free download. Anybody can download that no matter what, where they are in the world. Doesn't, Of course, don't, don't have to have resources to, to do that. We also posted the video of the broadcast we did detailing this information, showing people how they can, through ancestral religion, overcome all obstacles, including this obstacle as well as the video where we went through the book itself, point by point through the book, going through the four articles in the book and dissecting that information in detail. So we have all of that information on the page, but then we were also prompted to establish a cocoa ball eradicating this sexuality GoFundMe campaign. And the basis of that is to get as many copies of the soft cover version of our book, Cocoa Ball, to our people wherever we are in the country and in the world. Of course, they can download the software, the ebook version for free. And people have been downloading those um, since we published it last year, last summer, by the thousands, and of course that will continue. But we also need to get the soft cover version in the hands of our people as well. So our people can hold that information, study it, highlight it, share it with people when they're on the bus, share it with people at work, share it with people when they're wherever they are. 
everybody needs a copy of this information. It shows our ancient ancestral prohibition based on divine order, based on the forces of nature against this sexuality. It also shows the ramifications of how to overcome this perversity right here in the present and realigning ourselves with that sacred ancient ancestral morality and moral code. So everybody needs a copy of that publication. But then further, and let's, let's go to the Cocoa Ball page real quick. And as you see, the first thing, we, we post the link to the video. It's um, to a nearly three-hour broadcast. You download and that's right there on the page. We show the front cover of the book, and then we go on to some information. And this is what we say, and this is the basis of the campaign. Number one, to get those books out to as many of our people as possible. Of course, any donation that people make to our campaign of $15 or more you will receive, you can receive one or more uh, soft cover copies of any of our 16 books. Not only the Coco Ball book, but we, of course we have 16 books that we have published to date, a number of different titles, information on various aspects of ancestral religion, culture, and nation books. But, um, so part of it, of course, is get the books out, but then the other part is the training and the workshops that we do and expanding those offerings. All the trainings we do and workshops we do are free trainings and workshops that include Akumasa, substance abuse abstinence in the Afurakani Afurakaiti community, Akumadine, domestic abuse neutralization, overcoming those negative effects of domestic abuse, including the negative spirits that continue to influence individuals and keep them in that spiraling cycle, downward cycle, so they can elevate beyond that, repel those discarnate influences, and negativity so they can move forward. Akuma tra, trauma recovery alignment. And with trauma recovery alignment, we're talking about overcoming transcarnational suffering, intergenerational suffering, but also transcarnational suffering. Because some of these um, wounds that we have when somebody suffers very negatively in life and then they die in that condition, then uh, later on when they're suffering in the spirit realm as well, hanging around the spot where they were murdered for, for a generation, hanging around the house where they died for generations. At some point, the spirit re-enters into a womb and reincarnates and comes back into the world. Somebody coming through some, has a child in your family, this is an ancestor or ancestor's return. But sometimes one of those ancestors or ancestresses who suffered and died and they had never healed themselves, they had that open womb. When they had that open wound, it was never healed up. And they come into the world and they're still open and they, they suffer some different kinds of trauma and tragedy and draw different kinds of negative individuals and entities to them. And part of it is also the family itself, the mother and the father and the family members. They're not on their job as well. In fact, to the extent, because they have an established culture and been, been able to see what's going on with the child spiritually and put those cultural mechanisms in place, to repel these negative things because they weren't involved in anything cultural and grounded. They may have been out of order themselves. Then their trauma um, visiting the family on a regular basis or visiting the child, meaning the returning ancestor or ancestress, is not just a baby, it's an elder, an elder, an older person who has returned the spirit back into the world. And they're drawing negativity to them on a regular basis and people trying to figure out why are so many negative things happening. So we deal with that overcoming transcarnational trauma. When trauma is happening transcarnationally through successive incarnations, it's going back to, of course, curing that, healing that through ancestral communication, deity, invocation, and so forth. So we have that training as well. And, of course, um, dealing with this information with Paul Call Ball. So when people get access to such training, then they go out into their community dealing with not only their family members, but their community, people working with youth and working with other people, working in the mental health field, working um, in social services, educators and so forth, or just working in the community, connecting with people in the community, whether you're on Facebook or wherever you're at, wherever you are, you are emboldened with this information to teach, to show people, you know, we are not sentenced to some explosion of bisexuality, homosexuality in our community. In fact, we can eradicate it, and there is a movement to eradicate through ancestral religion, and we have that capacity. So people need to get that information through these workshops, of course, the training workshops that we do, um, the video versions, 
that we did on Blog Talk Radio, where we went through that information in detail for two to three hours. You can download those workshops. And we, we show the link here on the page. So let's go through the Cocoa Ball um, GoFundMe informational piece. So you'll see what we're dealing with. We say in our publishing publication, Cocoa Ball, and related broadcasts, we demonstrate that this sexuality, homosexuality, sexual deviance is not the nature of Afurakani, Afurakaitni, or African black people. It always occurs as a superimposition upon our people through various forms of trauma, molestation, rape, torture, propaganda, conditioning, and more. This trauma is born of the whites and their offspring and their culture of disorder. Said trauma can be intergenerational and transcarnational, as we just said. The negative spirits who seek to superimpose this perversity upon our people as a quote-unquote viable or natural lifestyle choice are the spirits of disorder, the whites and their offspring, as well as those of our people who have become spirits of disorder under the perverse influence of the whites and their offspring, that small percentage we talked about. Such individuals negatively influence our people in life through media, so-called educational institutions, pseudo-religious or pseudo-spiritual institutions, etc. And after death, as discarnate wayward spirits of disorder, for example, the white rapist so-called slave master who polluted the blood circle of our people 200 years ago by raping one of our great-great-great-great-grandmothers during enslavement, is now a discarnate, deceased spirit still hovering around those in that blood circle. If our spiritual immunity is compromised, such a wayward, perverse spirit will constantly seek to plant thoughts, ideas, urges in the children and adults of that blood circle influencing them towards this sexuality, homosexuality, not just in dreams. Yes, that will happen in dreams, but also during the course of everyday life. And these strong urges and strange ideas um, manifesting in the mind, thoughts and so forth, and visualization, we're assuming, why am I thinking about this? You're not thinking about it. It's somebody else trying to urge you in that direction. No different than somebody turning on a video and showing it and then showing it to you. What's in the video, what you're watching, what's in the movie, you're sitting there being engrossed in this video and this movie and the characters and everything else, those are not your thoughts. That's somebody else imposing some thoughts upon you, some visualizations on you. But you know that's what's happening because you're watching a video. You know somebody turned it on. You know all those luminous images you're seeing and the sounds and people talking is something that somebody else created and you're sitting there watching somebody else's idea. But if that happens spiritually, where an individual, an invisible entity, a discarnate rapist, so-called slave masters, constantly feeding ideas and images and thoughts and so forth in the minds of children as well as adults, then these ideas rise up in your head. And if your spiritual immunity is compromised, you assume every idea that shows up in your head must be yours. And if they keep showing up on a regular basis, day in and day out, night in and night out, you start to believe, well, if I'm thinking about this all the time, it must be part of who I am. And then you'll start to move in a direction where your behavior follows those ideas, and the next thing you know, you engage in perverse behavior. And then the whites and their offspring will seek through therapists and, and pseudo-spiritualists and psychologists and so forth to convince you, after you engage in that perverse behavior, and you start suffering because of that, because you have discordance, you know it's wrong, and you have recriminations and so forth, they start to try to convince you, hey, don't feel bad about that. You need to just continue because that's who you are. So all of that nonsense is going on, spiritually and physically. So we say such thoughts, ideas, and urges are triggered even more intensely if the child or later adult suffers from molestation, rape, torture, etc. in life. So not only did that white rapist slave master, his spirit hanging around the family whose blood he polluted, causing these thoughts and ideas to show up, but then they become triggered, as we said, more intensely if that child or later adult suffers from some molestation, rape, or torture, then that womb is opened in their spirit, and then that discarnate spirit who was already hanging around begins to feed even more of those urges and thoughts and ideas to them. However, through the practice of Afurakani, Afurakani, ancestral religion, 
We engage in ancestral communication. This includes the capacity to repel perverted spirits of rapists, such as the kind mentioned above. Once repelled for good, all thoughts, ideas, desires of dissexuality, homosexuality, experience since childhood through adulthood are gone, for they were never truly part of the Afurakani, Afurakani African black individuals' authentic thought processes from the beginning. The same is true of the constant propaganda promoted by the whites and their offspring via media, school, churches, pseudo-philosophy, pseudo-psychology, etc. When we embrace our Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestral religion, which is inherited by us through our blood circles from our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors, we can easily resist and repel the influence of such perverse propaganda. We also awaken other Afurakanu, Afurakainu, African black people as well. Many Afurakanu, Afurakainu Africans have eradicated this sexuality, homosexuality, through the embrace of ancestral religion. And many millions more will do the same until this cancer promoted by the whites and their offspring is eradicated. It is only a matter of time, and the spirits of disorder have no power to stop it. Through the practice of Afurakani, Afurakani, ancestral religion, our people are empowered to overcome all obstacles placed before us, inclusive of drug and alcohol addiction. Overcoming the perversity of dissexuality, homosexuality is simply one of many obstacles that are overcome when we engage the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. The expansive and contractive poles of Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral religion. It is realignment with divine order. So that's why we say we are raising funds to expand our offerings of free workshops and our free soft cover versions of our 16 books, including our book, Kokobo, to Afurakani, Afurakani people wherever we are in the country and, of course, in the world. We have been engaged in this work for over 10 years and endeavor to train larger numbers of our people to expand these efforts. As far as the 10 years, talking about the publications and the workshops that we've been doing. Of course, with regard to uh, the very first publication that we put forward that goes back uh, 20 years. Um, and then two years after that, the first solo book we put forward, the Ubin Shane, The Ancestral Summons, that was in the Gregorian year 1997, it was December um, 21st, as a matter of fact, on the summer solstice. 1997, of course, that's our year, 12,998. So that's going back then. But as far as the workshops, dealing with these kinds of workshops, that goes back 10 years. So, um, and we're, we're looking to uh, expand these efforts, um, train larger numbers of our people to expand these efforts. So we list the Akuma Tra, Trauma Recovery Alliance. When we deal with that overcoming transcarnational trauma, overcoming transcarnational suffering, of course, that naturally includes these obstacles dealing with um, molestation, rape, torture, and so forth that leads to all kinds of behavior. Some leads to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, all of these different things. So when you engage ancestral religious practices, you can overcome that and restore balance in your life, realign yourself with your crop, your kawa, your soul, your divine consciousness not dealing with some pseudo-therapist who has no clue about what's going on, and the influences from discarded relatives and non-relatives that are impacting the person's behavior, which no therapist is dealing with. They're just giving out medication and pseudo-philosophy and wasting people's time. But when you get rid of those negative entities and reestablish a communication with your own people, then that so-called disalignment or behavioral disorder is gone because it was really never a disorder in reality. It was a disalignment from your own crowd because of negative influences that you simply needed to remove. So that Akuma Tra workshop and information is key. The Akuma Sa substance abuse abstinence information, of course, that also leads to discordant behaviors, sometimes um, co-occurring disorders, including forms of mental illness and manifestations of behavioral illness, but also some people leading to dissexual, homosexual activity, people engaged in um, substance abuse 
They open themselves up not only to disease physically because they weaken their immunity, but you also open yourself up to disease spirit. They call alcohol spirit. It makes you weak. It compromises your immunity. Now you're susceptible to the suggestion, just like when someone is physically drunk, they can't fight back very often. Somebody can take control of them. When you're physically drunk, you also weaken your spiritual immunity and you're more open and receptive. And therefore, those influences and thoughts and negative projections from this kind of spirits and so forth, as well as the propaganda of this culture, can impact you. And then you begin to have these perverse urges. And then you start questioning who you are. And then the crackers move in and try to convince you that these urges are natural. You need to act on them. And you're in a dilemma, so you continue to use drugs to try to, you know, um, mask it, or you engage in some perverse behavior. And then you have even more anxiety because you engage in perverse behavior. And your crowd telling you that was perverse, but the crackers telling you it's all right. And now you're engaged in more anxiety and you do more drugs and so forth. So all of that can be overcome through these processes ritually. So we deal with that Akuma style substance abuse abstinence in the Afurakani Afurakani community and the Kum method for overcoming um, addictions through ritual practice. And then we have the Akuma Dine domestic abuse neutralization, it's the same process, and of course, the same Kum ritual method to overcome these negative effects of these discarnate spirits as well as the negative influence of other individuals who are constantly impacting the spirit of the person if, they, if you do not raise up your spiritual immunity by aligning with your intimam or in your own cross, then you'll be uh, swarmed by these negative influences and then end up being carried away in these influences and continuing this negative spiral, spiraling downward spiral, this negative cycle. But we can overcome that. And when we deal with domestic abuse, dealing with substance abuse, dealing with intergenerational and transcarnational trauma, people who are caught up in this dissexual, homosexual, discord of behavior, they typically have one or more of these different issues going on at the same time. But when you deal with ancestral religion, you knock all of them out at the same time. So we want to expand those workshops so that when our people get this information, they can share this information with others. We're impacting those who will impact others. We're, this is not a situation where we're, you know, taking on clients who are dissexuals and helping them over. Absolutely not. We don't do that. The information is already out there on the website. They can, if they're engaged in that perverse behavior, they can simply go to that website. They can begin to connect with their own insamampo, their ancestors and ancestors, and they are the ones who will help that individual overcome that perverse behavior and realign themselves with order. So we do not engage that. So nobody, do not call us if you are engaged in this sexuality asking for assistance because we do not do that. Your people, you have the capacity, number one, to stop engaging in this sexuality instantly right now just by becoming celibate instantly. And the only thing left is spiritually repelling those discordant urges, and you do that by connecting with your people. So this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about these workshops, talking about empowering our people, young as well as adults, because we empower uh, teenagers as well as preteens and so forth to let them know this sexuality, homosexuality, is perverse. It's insane. It's not to be accepted and not to allow the teachers in school and the media and the cracker Obama and everybody else who are praising this nonsense. We teach these youth as well as the adults, this is insane, it's perverse, and to stand against it at every measure. So, not only youth, but also adults, impacting those who will impact others. So when they get this information, information, they will impact other youth. They will impact, the adults will impact adults and youth, and the youth will impact other youth that they come in contact with. All it takes is one session, one workshop, they can, whether they can attend a workshop, or listen online and so forth and get the books and so forth. You have a 13-year-old studying cocoa ball and learning about this sexuality never happened in nature commit and the spiritual foundation of divine order and so forth. They are grounded and rooted, and nobody can bring that nonsense to them because they can shut them down, and they can capture other youth, their peers, and so forth. So we want to get that information out. This is a movement. And so we have all of that listed. And of course, we have our Afura whole life intervention a therapeutic model whereby we teach um, human services agents and so forth how to incorporate culture, physical soundness, spiritual soundness from the center of culture into their therapeutic interventions with their clients to 
um, address the whole um, spirit and mind of the person. So this is what we're dealing with. So when we have this, um, when you look on the site, when you look on the Cocoa Ball um, campaign, we have the links to those different pages. We have the link, of course, to the soft cover books, but also the e free ebook versions of the book. We have the link to the broadcast we did nearly three hours on Cocoa Ball eradicating dissexuality, homosexuality through ancestral religion. We have the link to our article, Amani Hunu, Overcoming Transcarnational Suffering, and the video, the broadcast. Um, that we did on Blog Talk Radio where we went through that entire process. We just summarized it here, but overcoming transcarnational suffering, the entire broadcast where we dissected that information. So anybody can get that information. They can get the article, study that, and then listen to the broadcast. Spent about nearly three hours going into that information in detail to show that process. And of course, they engage that ritual process to overcome transcarnational suffering as well as impact others to assist them. Whether they've gone through it themselves and come out of it, they can assist, or if you've never gone through it, but you want this information to spread it, to share it with family members, friends, coworkers, and people you are impacting, this is what we're dealing with. So we want to expand these services, expand the dissemination of these free books. Just like the White Snare Offspring spread misinformation data, they give away free Bibles, give away free Quran, they give away free books and pamphlets about promoting dissexuality, homosexuality to young children in schools and uh, the pseudo-spiritual organizations and, um, you know, summer programs, summer camp, after-school programs. They're constantly, even the doctors are trying to influence them and tell them, if, you know, if you come in contact with a child, another child that's dissexual, homosexual, is okay, that's who they are, and there's nothing wrong with that. Every facet of society, they are constantly promoting dissexuality, homosexuality. What is our backstop against that and what is our response? Not only do we respond by promoting the Apurakani, Apurakani family and family values and so forth, which is good. We have organizations who are engaged in that process, showing positive images of Apurakani, Apurakani families and talking about positivity in that regard and restoring that whole notion of family. But we also must have a mechanism a method and letting people know we have a method to eradicate this sexuality, homosexuality, to come out of no matter how long, how many years somebody has been engaged in that process. If you've been engaged in it since you were a child and now you're 50, eradicate it overnight. You can stop it instantly and you can perpetuate that and begin to show that information. So that is what changes the game. It's not enough to just say this is not part of our culture. What about the people who are already engaged in it? We must be able to show that we can overcome it. And just like we do that, overcoming drug addiction is one thing to say. You can, you can lay out all the information about drugs and how negative they are in the body and what they do to the brain and the nervous system and the organs and systems, and all that information is perfect. But what about somebody who's already engaged in the use and they're destroying themselves and they are addicted? Giving them information about drugs is not enough. You must give them a method to overcome the addiction, in the addiction. It's not enough simply to say that the African family is the balance of the male and the female who give birth to the children. That's perfect, and we do need that information. But we must also have a mechanism, a ritual method, so that our people who are already get out of it. Um, and permanently, and we have that. It's always been embedded within our ancestral religious practice. Any obstacle we need to overcome is embedded within our ancestral religious practice. So that is the basis of this Kokoba movement, eradicating this sexuality, homosexuality, from the Afurakani, Afurakani African black community worldwide. So we do not let cancerous, parasitic, the white and offspring tell us what we can and cannot do. We tell them and we crush them and we do what we need to do. So that's the purpose of this campaign. So we want people to, of course, join the page on Facebook, um, go to our website as well. Any donation you make to the Cocoa Ball Fund movement, um, of course, you, will, you can receive, you have the option of receiving one or more of our soft cover books any one of the 16 books, um, one or more of those books, 
you have that option, of course. Um, so it's not just a free donation. You're actually not only going to receive books, so it's like a purchase in that sense, if you would like to do so. But at the same time, you're helping to expand this information, get these soft cover books. If you can imagine millions of our people with these books in their home, every single Afurakani, Afurakani home, somebody has a copy of Koko Ba, proving that this sexuality has never been part of our culture. So when any one of the whites in our screen seek to attempt to say, well, you know, this has always been African and, you know, all people have been, absolutely not. But then it also grounds us in our morality. And then we begin to engage in ancestral religious practice to repel this perversity as well as other manifestations of perversity in the society that constantly they seek to impose upon us. So this is what we're dealing with. Thousands and into the millions of our people in this country and around the world, of course, they're trying to force this sexuality in Afuraka, Afuraka, and Thai, foreign aid, international aid, and so forth, to Afuraka, Afuraka, and government with their desire to um, repel this sexuality. So if, if you repel this sexuality and you're not going to legalize gay so-called marriage or same-sex so-called marriage, if you refuse to do that as a leader of an Afurakani, Afurakani culture, uh, country, then the white and spring will seek to tie your aid um, directly to that policy initiative. If you refuse, then they're going to pull back the aid. They're trying to force this sexuality upon our people. Some of our people are resisting that intelligence. We need to uh, assist them with that resistance. And we have done the work. We've done the scholarship to prove this sexuality never existed in ancient Kemet. We were the first to prove that information with these specific texts and properly translate them, specifically dealing with the maxims of Ptahatep and the datings of um, the contendings of Heru and Set as well as showing the cosmological foundation for Ni'an Kanum and Kanum Hatep being identical twins and divinity, a patron divinity of twins being Kunwimu or Kanum and so forth. Nobody published that before we put that information out. So imagine our people all around the country and around the world having access to this book in their hands and their children having this book so they can study this information with their youth, with their children, with their community, and so forth. This is what we are endeavoring to do. So this, this was the purpose of this special broadcast to announce this movement, join that Facebook page. Um, and I'm looking in the chat room real quick before we end. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, of course, you can hit the number one. Um, we're looking in the chat room to make sure we didn't miss any questions or a comment. And I see that there was a comment here in the chat room. Um, how can we effectively approach members of the high and mighty gay community who swear they are the stuff and that our movement, movements are nothing without them? <clears throat> Just drop the information and, and bounce. Is that the, that's the question? And hope they read it. Now, of course, the vast majority of our people who get engaged, as we said, in this perverse behavior through rape and torture and, and trauma and so forth, molestation. Some of them have developed defense mechanisms so they pretend like they're proud of who they are. And they try to pretend like they're really, you know, promoting this nonsense. And you can see right through the reality that they're depressed about who they are. They're, they really know that they're disaligned and they're dealing with the defense mechanism. So people who are sincere about information, you give the information, disseminate the information to our people. Those who are sincere, they will take the information. Those who are not sincere, they will seek to argue, but you don't waste any time arguing with these clowns because they're, as long as they're discordant, they're also disaligned. So they're spiritually and emotionally unstable. They're disaligned. Anybody who's engaged in that discordant behavior, clearly they're disaligned. If a male is trying to get with another male, that's insane behavior. They're disaligned from their own crop. So, of course, they're going to manifest some emotional instability some intellectual and spiritual and mental instability, so you don't waste time arguing with somebody who is emotionally unstable and spiritually disaligned. You give the information, and that's that. If they're sincere, they'll take it upon themselves to incorporate that information. If they were insincere or if they were the criminal type who are seeking to promote it, no matter what you say at any time in any way, will they accept because their goal is that criminal behavior. So, of course, those criminal types are our enemies anyway. 
They're not our brothers and sisters. They are our enemies. They're no different than the KKK. So we don't seek to transform them. We only want to eradicate these criminal enemies in our community, just like we want to eradicate the KKK who's murdering our people. So we don't seek to embrace them at all. They become cancerous cells, and that's who they are. Cancerous cells deserve to be eradicated. Just like cancer cells in your body deserve to be eradicated. So those who are sincere, they will embrace the information. Those who are not, they show you who you are. The vast majority of our people are against this sexuality, homosexuality, and we will empower them, empower families, empower women, children, men, of course, teenagers, and so forth. When you give them real information now, they are emboldened. They know deep down inside it's nonsense. They know that the culture is forcing this nonsense upon them. And some of them are starting to fall into, well, maybe we should accept it, or maybe that's just what they do in the privacy of their own home, and I don't want to discriminate against anybody. No, we teach, of course, discrimination is intelligent. That's judgment. Proper judgment is the hallmark of maturity. The whites and our screen want you to reject any kind of assessment and embrace everything. That's insane. Your immune system is all about discrimination. Your immunity is dependent upon discrimination. They discriminate between which substances are healthy to the body, which cells are not, and they discriminate, they separate, they isolate, and they kill those who are not healthy to the body. So we're not concerned about those who are simply, well, we shut them down and we shut them out. And we focus on the people who really want real information because the vast majority of our people really are against this perversity. And we can embolden and empower them. And those who are actually engaged in the perversity, they are emboldened and empowered when they get their hands on the information and go directly to their people. And again, they don't come to us. They go to their people, come out of that perversity, and then they begin to share their stories of how they came out of this sexuality. That's the next phase, which comes up very quickly, and they begin to show there is a pathway out. And that's what the whites and our screen do not want to see but it's too late because it's already beginning to take place and it will just simply expand. So, okay, so that, I think that was the only question in the chat room. Okay, Yeni Aceda, we appreciate that question. Okay, so we can, we can end the broadcast here, but we, we simply ask, share the information, join the, like the page on Facebook, share the page on Facebook, um, if you are able, please make a contribution to the Call Call Ball Fund or any public um, purchase of one or more of our books. I'll, of course, that always supports everything we're doing anyway. So whether you made a purchase of our soft cover books or you went to the Call Call Ball page, the GoFundMe page for Call Call Ball and made a donation there. If you would like one or more of our books in return for your donation, just let us know when you're making the donation which of the books you would like to receive. So that, and, you know, Send us that information so we can send that out to you, and we, you know, you can do that through the email and everything. Um, please share the GoFundMe page as well. This is a movement, and this is a movement for Afurakani, Afurakani people in general. There's one thing about this particular movement, even when people are not engaged in ancestral religion, when they recognize that there is a method and there's a foundation, and people are talking about listen, no matter who you are. As long as you're black anywhere around the world, Afurakani, Afurakani, or African people do not accept this sexuality. And we have the proof textually, cosmologically, as well as ritually, that that has always been true. We've always been against that. Any black person recognizes that's real. Even if they're a devout Christian, devout Muslim, caught up in that nonsense, when there's an Afurakani, Afurakani person talking about we are against this sexuality, and we are only supportive of real families, men, women, and children, and we talk about proving that this sexuality is not part of our culture, and we have methods to come out of that and restore our people, they're down with that, even if they're not down with ancestral religion, but they are definitely down with overcoming and eradicating this sexuality, homosexuality. So just to see that line, the eradication of this sexuality, homosexuality in our community, every black person in the country and around the world fundamentally is down with that. So when you share this information, even if they weren't, again, you know, interested in quote-unquote African culture that they believe they were not, 
they will be interested in this because they're already feeling it. They already feel that within themselves. And so when they see somebody, re, you know, um, validate what they're talking about, so that inner essence, then they will embrace it on some level. So please share the GoFundMe page, share the Hulk Call Ball page on Facebook, share our page, of course, on our website, dealing with this information, and we will get this movement expansive, not just in this country, but around the world, wherever our people are. So we want to say yerase. We thank you for tuning in to this special broadcast. We will be uploading this broadcast as a video on YouTube as well, so you can share that as well. And again, Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. And Yerase, we thank you for tuning in. That's up.